Τη αποξινή διάλεξη προηγήθηκε η τελετή υπογραφή των συμφωνιών για τα προγράμματα που χρηματοδοτούνται κάτω από του χρηματοδοτικού μηχανισμού του Ευρωπαϊκού Οικονομικού Χώρου Νορβηγία 2009-2014. Είναι τιμή μα που φιλοξενούμε απόψε τον κύριο Μάρτιν Σκάνκε, ιδρυτή και διευθύνοντα σύμβουλο τη Σκάνκε Consulting. Μετά το πέρα τη διάλεξη θα ακολουθήσει η συζήτηση. Η συζήτηση θα συντονίσει ο αναπληρωτή καθηγητή χρηματοοικονομική. Κύριο Γιώργο Νησότη. Στο σημείο αυτό, καλείται στο βήμα ο Πρίτανη του Πανεπιστημίου Κύπρου, καθηγητή Κωνσταντίνο Χρυστοφίτη, για να απευθύνει σύντομο χαιρετισμό. Κύριε Πρίτανη, ο λόγο σε εσά. Αξιότιμοι κύριοι πρέσβει, Έντιμα μέλη τη Αντιπροσωπεία του Υπουργείου Εξωτερικών τη Νορβηγία, αγαπητά μέλη του Συμβουλίου και τη Συμβουλίου του Πανεπιστημίου Κύπρου, κύριε Σκάνκερ, κύριε Γενική Διευθυντή του Γραφείου Προγραμματισμού, εκλεκτή προσκεκλημένη, αγαπητέ και αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, κυρίε και κύριοι, αγαπητέ φοιτήτριε και αγαπητοί φοιτητέ, με ιδιαίτερη χαρά. Σα καλωσορίζω στην αποψηνή διάλεξη που συνδιοργανώνονται από το Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου, το Γραφείο Προγραμματισμού και την Πρεσβεία τη Νορβηγία και με κύριο μιλητή, τον Ιδρυτή και Διευθύνων Σύμβουλο τη Κάγκελ Κονσάρτη, κύριο Μάρκο Κάγκελ, τον οποίο ευχαριστώ που αποδέχτηκε την πρόσκλησή μα. Η οικονομική κρίση αναχαιτίζει την αναπτυξιακή πορεία του τόπου μα. Ωστόσο, η ανακάλυψη του φυσικού αερίου στην αποκλειστική οικονομική ζώνη της Κύπρου αποτελεί αχτίδα φωτός. Όμως, το αντίκτυπο της αξιοποίησης του ενεργειακού μας πλούτου εξαρτάται από εμάς, από τους ηγέτες του τόπου και τις οντότητες που θα αναλάβουν την διαχείρισή του. Επιπλέον, η εμπειρία διαχείρισης ενεργειακού πλούτου από άλλε χώρε πρέπει να μελετήσει σωστά, ώστε η στρατηγική αξιοποίηση του πλούτου της χώρας μας και η σκιαγράφηση ορθής διαχειριστικής πολιτικής να διαμορφωθούν σωστά, βασιζόμενοι στα καλά μοντέλα διαχείρισης και προς αποφυγή τυχόν λαθών που θα μας κοστίσουν ακριβά. Πρέπει λοιπόν να μελετηθούν τόσο τα αποτελεσματικά όσο και αυτά που αποδείχθηκαν αναποτελεσματικά μοντέλα διαχείρισης, ούτως ώστε από τα πρώτα να αξιοποιηθούν η τεχνογνωσία, οι πρακτικές, το ήθος και τα κίνητρα σκιαγράφησης της ορθής διαχειριστικής πολιτικής. Και από τα δεύτερα, να διαβάσουμε τις κακές πρακτικές που οδήγησαν στην αποτυχία, να τις αποφύγουμε και να τις αποβάλουμε από το δικό μας σύστημα. Εν τούτης, διατηρώ έντονες επιφυλάξεις για το μέχρι στιγμή χειρισμό του θέματος σχετικά με τον νέο αυτό κεφαλό της πατρίδας μας. Φοβάμαι, για παράδειγμα, να μην κληρονομήσουμε μια καταστραμμένη οικολογικά ανατολική Μεσόγειο με εκατοντάδες γεωτρήσεις και το όφελος των εξορίξεων να καθόνονται ξένες εταιρείε, ενώ κάποιοι εδώ θα φιλοδεξούν να μετατραπούν σε κομματικούς εμίριδες και πολιτικού σε Αυτά δεν τα λέω μόνο για του σημερινού κυβερνώντε, αλλά και για του επόμενου και του μεθεπόμενου. Δυστυχώ σήμερα οι θεσμοί και οι αξίε μα τίθενται υπό συνεχή αμφισβήτηση και η βελτίωσή του είναι πρακτική επιτακτική ανάγκη. Η κοινωνία μα πάσχει από την έλλειψη εμπιστοσύνη στου θεσμού, γιατί πολλέ φορέ πάσχουν αυτοί που εκπροσωπούν του θεσμού. Θα επαναλάβω για μία ακόμη φορά πω για να πάει μπροστά ο τόπο μα χρειάζονται οι κατάλληλοι άνθρωποι στι κατάλληλε θέσει με περισσή ευθυκρισία και ευμάθεια. Χρειάζεται διαφάνεια, συνοδοτυπορία λόγων και έργων, σοβαρότητα και υπερκομματικέ πρακτικέ. Ακούμε και λέμε ότι πρέπει το συλλογικό συμφέρον να είναι πάνω από το ατομικό. Είναι καιρός να το πράξουμε. Δυστυχώς, το κράτος μας είναι θεμελιωμένο 
στην αξιπλατεία σε πολλά επίπεδα. Η ανομαλία αυτή δεν είναι μόνο αδικία αντιπροσώπων, αλλά μάστηκα και κίνδυνο για την ευημερία ολόκληρου του κοινωνικού συνόλου. Είναι ένα σύστημα που παράγει συνεχώ χαμένε ευκαιρίε, που κοστίζει πολύ μεταφορικά και κυριολεκτικά, που ανακυκλώνει τι χαμηλέ προσδοκίε και τελικά προκαλεί την απάθεια και αποστασιοποίηση των πολιτών. Ξέρετε, αυτό που καθόρισε την επιτυχία του νορδικού μοντέλου ήταν η διαφάνεια, η συνεχή λογοδοσία, ο επαγγελματισμό των εμπλεκομένων και η ανάμειξη όλη τη κοινωνία στην αξιοποίηση του φυσικού αερίου. Ο κύριο Μάρτιν Σκάνκεν θα μα παρουσιάσει λοιπόν πρακτικέ διαχείριση των πετρελαϊκών εσόδων. Η εξειδίκευσή του στα κρατικά και ελληνικά κεφάλαια και η πείρα του στη διαχείριση του, του Νορβηγικού Κρατικού Ταμείου Συντάξεων δίνεται να βοηθήσει και την Κύπρο στη χάραξη στρατηγική για ένα ανάλογο μοντέλο. Θαυμάζει κανεί στο Νορβηγικό μοντέλο την έγνοια του για τις μελλοντικέ γενιές. Αυτή πρέπει να είναι και η δική μας έγνοια σήμερα. Πρέπει να αντισταθούμε σε λογικές που θέλουν το ξεπούλημα των φυσικών πόρων πριν την εξόριξή τους. Με την οικονομική κρίση και τη μάστιγα της ανεργίας να πλήττει, ιδιαίτερα τους νέους μας, πρέπει να μεριμνήσουμε για να τους διασφαλίσουμε ένα καλύτερο αύριο. Πρέπει να τους δώσουμε ευκαιρίε και να διασφαλίσουμε ότι και οι μελλοντικές ταινιές θα καρποθούν τα ωφέλη από την εγκατάλευση του ενεργειακού μας πλούτου. Κύριε και κύριοι, το Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου, μπροστά στις προκλήρες των καιρών, δηλώνει παρόν, δίδοντας βήμα σε ανθρώπους και προσωπικότητες που έχουν να μοιραστούν μαζί μας τις εμπειρίες τους και να μας διδάξουν. Δηλώνουμε παρόντες και διαλογόμαστε για άλλη μια φορά με την κοινωνία για πλέγοντα θέματα. Η κερή είναι δύσκολη, για την αντιμετώπιση των δυσκολιών επιβάλλεται η παρέμβαση των πολιτών. Επιβάλλεται να είμαστε απαιτητικοί με τους ηγέτες μας, να είμαστε απαιτητικοί με τους εαυτούς μας. Η οικονομία μας δεν θα ορθοποδήσει μόνο με τη σωστή αξιοποίηση του πετρολαϊκού μας πλούτου. Υπάρχουν πολλές πρακτικές σε διάφορους τομείς διοίκησης που πρέπει να επαναπροσδιοριστούν για να οικοδομήσουμε σύντομα μια δυνατή οικονομία και να επιδερκήσουμε το αίσθημα της ασφάλειας μεταξύ των πολιτών. Απευθυνόμενος στους νέους ανθρώπους, στους φοιτητές μας, θα ήθελα να τους επαναλάβω με έμφαση ότι δεν πρέπει να χτίζουμε όνειρα βασισμένα μόνο στο φυσικό πλούτο. Φρόνω ότι ο διαχρονικός χρυσός μιας χώρας, ο διαχρονικός πλούτος μιας χώρας, είναι η δημιουργικότητα των ανθρώπων τη. Εξάλλου, το μέγεθος μιας χώρας δεν εξαρτάται από το μέγεθος, από το γεωγραφικό της μέγεθος, ούτε από το μέγεθος του πληθυσμού τη. Το μέγεθος μιας χώρας εξαρτάται από τα μυαλά των νέων ανθρώπων τη. Η αριστεία, λοιπόν, δεν είναι υπόθεση μεγέθους. Ο πλούτος και η δημιουργικότητα της σύγχρονης εποχής είναι η σκέψη, η γνώση και η κοινοτομία. Αυτό δεν πρέπει να το ξεχνάμε, όσο φυσικό αέρο και αν έχουμε. Σας ευχαριστώ. Ευχαριστούμε κύριε Τιντανή. Ο Γενικός Διευθυντής του Γραφείου Προγραμματισμού, κύριος Γιώργος Γεωργίου, καλείται στο μήμα για να χαιρετήσει την εκδήλωση. Κύριε Γεωργίου, ο λόγος σε εσάς. Κυρία και κύριε Διευθυντρία, κύριε Πλήτανη, κύριε Πρέσβη, υπελεκτή προσυγκεκριμένη, κύριε Συγκύρι. Είναι με ιδιαίτερη χαρά και ικανοποίηση που απευθύνω σήμερα αυτό το χαιρετισμό στη διάλεξη διαχείριση πετρελιακού πλούτου, μαθήματα και εμπειρίε από ένα καταξιωμένο μιλητή, αφενό διότι αφορά ένα θέμα με ιδιαίτερο ενδιαφέρον για την Κύπρο, και αφεντέρου διότι αυτή πραγματοποιείται με την ευκαιρία τη υπογραφή των συμφωνιών χρηματοδότηση δύο προγραμμάτων κάτω από τι χορηγίε του Ευρωπαϊκού Οικονομικού Χώρου και Θεοπηγία για την περίοδο 2009-2014. Για τον λόγο αυτό, θα μου επιτρέψετε στο χαιρετισμό μου να αναφερθώ στη συντομία στι χορηγίε αυτέ. Η υπογραφή των συμφωνιών χρηματοδότηση, η οποία προηγήθηκε τη παρούσα διάλεξη, σηματοδοτεί την έναρξη τη υλοποίηση των δύο προγραμμάτων 
Ένα χρόνο μετά την υπογραφή του Μνημονίου τη Συνατήριξη μεταξύ του Γραφείου Προγραμματισμού, ω Εθνικού Σημείου Επαφή Εκπαίδευση και Κυριακή Κυβέρνηση και των τριών κρατών δωρητών του ΔΕΟΠ, δηλαδή τη Νορβηγία, τη Ισλανδία και του Λίχτεστάιν το Δεκέμβριο του 2011. Η υπογραφή του Μνημονίου τη Συνατήριξη τόσο με την Κυπριακή Δημοκρατία, όσο και με τι υπόλοιπε 14 χώρε μέλη τη Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση, που επίση εποφελούνται από τι χορηγίε, στοχεύουν στον καθορισμό του πλαισίου και τη διαχείριση τη βοήθεια που παραχωρείται από τα κράτη των τέσσερα. Η βοήθεια αυτή παραχωρείται στα πλαίσια των συμφωνιών που έχουν συνάψει οι τρει χώρε με την Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση για τον Ευρωπαϊκό Οικονομικό Χώρο και αποτελεί συνέχεια τη βοήθεια που παραχωρήθηκε κατά την περίοδο 2004-2009. Οι χορηγίε που παρέχονται μέσω των δύο χρηματοδοτικών μηχανισμών αποτελούν συνεισφορά των τριών χωρών στη μείωση των οικονομικών και κοινωνικών ανισοτήτων στον ευρωπαϊκό οικονομικό χώρο και στοχεύουν παράλληλα και στην ενδυνάμωση των κυβερνών του σχέσεων με τα 15 κράτη δικαιούχου. Η συνεισφορά αυτή είναι πάρα πολύ σημαντική για τι δικαιούχε χώρε αλλά και για την Ευρωπαϊκή Ένωση ω σύνολο, εφόσον μέσα από τι χορηγίε χρηματοδοτούνται έργα και πρωτοβουλίε. Που έχουν άμεσα και θετικά αποτελέσματα στη βελτίωση τη ποιότητα ζωή των πολιτών, ιδιαίτερα στου τομεί όπου η χρηματοδότηση από άλλε πηγέ είναι περιορισμένη, όπω παραδείγματο χάρη η στήριξη τη κοινωνία των πολιτών. Αναφέρω χαρακτηριστικά ότι κατά την προγραμματική περίοδο 2004-2009 χρηματοδοτήθηκαν συνολικά 1.200 έργα περίπου. Σε χρηματικού όρου, η συνεισφορά αυτή είναι επίση πολύ σημαντική. Κατά την περίοδο 2004-2009, Διαθέτηκαν συνολικά πόροι ύψου 1,3 δισεκατομμυρίων ευρώ, ενώ κατά την παρούσα περίοδο θα διατεθούν ποσά ύψου 1,79 δισεκατομμυρίων. Όσον αφορά την Κύπρο, τα μνημόνια συναντήληψη για την περίοδο 2009-2014 προνοούν για χρηματοδότηση ύψου 3,5 εκατομμυρίων ευρώ κάτω από τον μηχανισμό τη ΔΕΟΧ και 3,7 εκατομμυρίων κάτω από τον μηχανισμό τη Νορβηγία. Οι τομεί τη προτεραιότητα και τα έργα που θα χρηματοδοτηθούν αφορούν του τομεί τη δημόσια υγεία, τη ενδοοικογενειακή και έμφυλη βία, τη διοξίδη και εσωτερικών υποθέσεων, τη στήριξη τη κοινωνία των πολιτών, τη βιοποικιλότητα και οικοσυστημάτων, των παιδιών και νεαρών ατόμων που αντιμετωπίζουν κινδύνου και τη διατήρηση και αναζωογόνηση τη πολιτιστική και φυσική κληρονομιά. Τα έργα θα υλοποιηθούν τόσο από κρατικού φορεί, όσο και από φορεί που εμπίπτουν στην κατηγορία των μη κυβερνητικών οργανισμών. Από αυτά θα υποφεληθούν άμεσα κυβερνητικά τμήματα, μη κυβερνητικέ οργανώσει, τοπικέ κοινωνίε, μαθητέ, παιδιά και νεαρά άτομα, πολλαπλέ αναπηρίε, κύματα ενδοκιμιακή βία, ιστορικοί και ερευνητέ, επιστήμονε του νομέα τη υγεία και γενικότερα το ευρύ κοινό τη ΧΙΠ. Η επιτυχή συνοποίηση των έργων αυτών αναμένεται να συμβάλλει θετικά στη βελτίωση τη ποιότητα ζωή των Κυπρίων πολιτών στο σύνολό του. Έχοντα ιδιαίτερα υπόψη ότι αρκετά από τα έργα περιλαμβάνουν και την δικοινωτική διάσταση. Με τον τρόπο αυτό, συμβάλλουν και στην πρόοδο τη συνεργασία και του διαλόγου μεταξύ των δύο κοινοτήτων στην Κύπρο. Δύο από τα έργα θα υλοποιηθούν στη συνεργασία με εταίρου από τα κράτη των ΡΙΤΕΣ, δηλαδή το Συμβούλιο τη Ευρώπη και την Ορμηγική Κίνηση Καταφυγείων, προωθώντα έτσι και το δεύτερο στόχο των χωριών, που ανάφερα προηγουμένω, δηλαδή την ενδυνάμωση των διμερών σχέσεων ανάμεσα στα κράτη των ΡΙΤΕΣ και στα κράτη δικαιούχου. Ο στόχο αυτό προωθείται επίση με τη χρησιμοποίηση πόρων αποκλειστικά για μέτρα και δραστηριότητε που αφορούν τι συνεργασίε μεταξύ φορέων και ιδρυμάτων, παραγωγή κοινών αποτελεσμάτων, βελτίωση τη γνώση και τη αμοιβαία κατανόηση. Είναι μέσα σε αυτό ακριβώ το πλαίσιο που πραγματοποιείται η σημερινή διάλεξη. Οι γνώσει και οι εμπειρίε τη Νορβηγία στα θέματα τη διαχείριση του πετρελαιακού πλούτου είναι παγκόσμια αναγνωρισμένε. Και αποτελούν πρότυπο για χώρε όπω την Κύπρο που μόλι τώρα αρχίζουν να κάνουν τα πρώτα του βήματα στον τομέα τη αξιοποίηση αυτού του είδου του φυσικού πλούτου. Στην παρούσα οικονομική κατάσταση, οι υδρογονάθρωπε αποτελούν μια σημαντική ελπίδα για την κοινωνία και την εθνική οικονομία και η ενημέρωση για τα μαθήματα και τι εμπειρίε άλλων πετυχημένων χωρών όπω η Νορβηγία δεν μπορεί παρά να προκαλούν το ενδιαφέρον και την προσοχή μα. Η Κυπριακή Δημοκρατία έχει ήδη προβεί στη δημιουργία και εγγραφή τη κρατική εταιρεία υδρογονάθρωπων Κύπρου. Χρησιμοποιώντα ω πρότυπο το δραστατικό τη νορβηγική εταιρεία Στατόι στα πλαίσια πάντα του δικού μα νομικού συστήματο, δηλαδή των περιεταιριών νόμων. Σύμφωνα με ειδική πρόνοια που υπάρχει στο καταστατικό τη εταιρεία, τα έσοδα από τι δραστηριότητε τη θα καταλήγουν στο Εθνικό Ταμείο Υπεργοναθράκων, 
το οποίο θα συσταθεί με νόμο και το αποτελεσματικό του θα διατίθεται για την ανατροφοδότηση της βιομηχανίας υδρογων ανθράκων, συμπεριλαμβανωμένων των επενδύσεων για την κατασκευή των αναγκαίων υποδομών, τη διάθεση ενός ποδοστού στον ετήσιο κρατικό προϋπολογισμό και την αποταμίευση ενός ποδοστού ως επένδυση για την περιοχικές γενιές των Κυπριών πολιτών. Έχοντα υπόψη την επιτυχία του Ευρωπαϊκού Πετρελαιακού Ταμείου, γνωστού ω The Government Pension Fund of Norway, και τη σημαντική συμβολή του ομιλητή κ. Μάρτιν Σκάλκερ στο σχεδιασμό και διαχείριση αυτού του ταμείου, θεωρώ ότι δεν μπορούσαμε να έχουμε καλύτερη έναρξη για τα προγράμματα που χρηματοδοτούνται από τι χορηγίε του ΕΟΚ και τη Τουρκία, ούτε και πιο ενδιαφέρον θέμα για πρόωθηση και ενδυνάμωση των διπλών μα σχέσεων. Κλείνοντα αυτόν τον σύντομο χαιρετισμό, θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω εκ μέρου τη Κυπριακή Κυβέρνηση τα κράτη των ΙΤΕΣ για την βοήθεια που παραφορούν μέσα από του χρηματοδοτικού κανονισμού, καθώ και για την άψογη και επικοδομητική συνεργασία μα κατά τα τελευταία πέντε χρόνια. Ευχαριστώ επίση τον ομιλητή κύριο Μάρτιν Στάνκε για την προτιμία του να είναι σήμερα μαζί μα για να μοιραστεί τι εμπειρίε και τι γνώσει του πάνω στο σημαντικό θέμα τη διαχείριση του πετρελαιακού πλούτου, καθώ και όλου εσά για την εδώ παρουσία και συμμετοχή σα. Σα ευχαριστώ. Permanent Secretary, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. In the 1960s, the head of exploration in British Petroleum said that if any oil was found on the Norwegian continental shelf, he would personally drink it. <laughs> His crystal ball should have been better polished. Today, Norway produces more than 2 million barrels of oil every day. This puts <coughs> us up among the six, seven largest exporters of oil in the world and the second largest exporter of gas. It is with great pleasure that we have been able to combine the launch of the EEA and Norway grants to Cyprus with a lecture on Norway's lessons and experiences for managing our petroleum wealth. For new members in the audience, for the grant period we officially launched today, the support <coughs> to Cyprus has been increased to 7.85 million euros. The EEA and Norway grants offer new opportunities for Norway and Cyprus to work together on important issues like health, environment, domestic violence, cultural heritage, combating money laundering, as well as supporting civil society and dialogue across the divide. All of the funds and projects lay the foundation to expand and further develop the relations between Norway and Cyprus. The EEA and Norway grants are investing in people and investing in the future, producing results with a long-term impact. In that respect, there are similarities to the goal of the Norwegian government pension fund global. It is not quick returns, but security for Norwegians of the future. This made it possible to amass a pension fund that currently owns more than 1% of global share value. The fund also has a long-term perspective. We have experienced increased interest for the setup and management of the fund, also from Cyprus. For setting the strategy and overseeing the operations of the pension fund, Mr. Martin Skanke has played an important role. He was Director General and Head of the Asset Management Department of the Norwegian Ministry of Finance from 2006 to 2011. Therefore, I can think of a few others better suited to share the Norwegian experiences in the field of petroleum revenues management. On behalf of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
I hope that you will all enjoy the lecture. Thank you, Ms. Wallace. Προχωράμε με την παρουσίαση των μελητή, τον κύριο Μάρτιν Σκάνγκε, θα παρουσιάσει ο αναπληρωτής καθηγητής χρηματοοικονομικής, κύριο Γιώργος Νησιώτης. Κύριε Νησιώτη, ο λόγος σε εσάς. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I accepted the task of introducing our guest speaker tonight with uh, great pleasure and enthusiasm because the topic is timely and important and because he is uniquely qualified to address the issues. Uh, the presentation is entitled Managing Petroleum Wealth, which is up there, and the Government Pension Fund Global. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of these issues for Cyprus at uh, this particular point in time. The vital part in the process of our own natural gas exploitation is the management of the expected wealth creation. Our decisions and actions on this front have a chance to really make a difference in the lives of current and future generations of the people of Cyprus. The complexities and breadth of the issues involved demand that we take the time to encourage a structured, productive, and transparent debate among experts and all stakeholders, including the public, in order to reach the best possible outcome. Mr. Martin Skanke's qualifications and expertise promised that his presentation this evening will provide invaluable insights to this debate. Beyond his education at high quality academic institutions and his professional CFA qualification, what really stands out on his CV is his professional experience. Here are some highlights. He's currently an independent consultant specializing in advising advise sovereign wealth funds on investment and governance issues. Very relevant for his presentation topic this evening is his expertise as the Director General and Head of the Asset Management Department of the Norwegian Ministry of Finance from 2006 to 2011. The department is responsible for setting the strategy and overseeing the operations of the Norwegian Government Pension Fund. The fund had capital of over 500 billion US dollars at the end of 2010. It now stands over 600 billion dollars. And it is known as one of the most transparent in the world receiving the highest Truman scoreboard rating of any sovereign wealth fund. Mr. Skanke also served as Norwegian representative in drafting the San Diego principles for sovereign wealth funds. A well-designed structured sovereign wealth fund can serve as a valuable fiscal policy tool, and our speaker has extensive experience on that front as well. From 2002 to 2006, he served as the Director General and Head of the Domestic Policy Department of the Office of the Prime Minister of Norway, and he has previously been head of the section of monetary policy and public finances at the Royal Norwegian Ministry of Finance. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Mr. Martin Stank. Mr. Permanent Secretary, distinguished guests, um, your Excellencies, um, it is a pleasure to stand here. I have to say that uh, after all of these very generous, kind introductions, I am almost afraid that this, the presentation itself will be sort of an, a, a disappointment to you. But uh, uh, hopefully I will be able to share some of the experiences that we made in Norway over the years on these, and also uh, some experiences from other countries on these issues that are really uh, timely and relevant um, for Cyprus, but I think also for many other countries, because we have seen a decade almost of relatively high prices for oil, gas, and other raw materials. And this has led to uh, accumulation of assets in a large number of countries where they have established sovereign wealth funds to deal with that, or they have been faced with the challenge of managing uh, resource revenues. And this is true for countries in Africa, in South America, in Europe, and in Asia. So this is a global phenomenon, the growth in sovereign wealth funds, but also the challenges in managing resource revenues. And I think the issues concerning management of, 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 of natural resource wealth really falls into three broad categories. 
The first category is related to macroeconomic policy issues. So those are issues that relate to how do these petroleum revenues affect macroeconomic policy and what is the correct macroeconomic policy uh, formulation in the life of these revenues. The second set of issues are issues related to investment strategy for a petroleum fund. So if you're in your macroeconomic policy strategy means that you're accumulating money in the fund, what is the right way of managing those assets? And the third set of issues are governance issues or institutional issues. So given that you have uh, an economic policy which entails building up funds, and given that you have a fund, how should you think about management uh, and what sort of governance structure do you need? And these three sets of issues are related. The macroeconomic role of the fund will determine what is a good investment strategy. Uh, the complexity of the investment strategy will determine how much robustness you need in your governance structure. And the quality of the governance structure will determine how legitimate the fund is as a tool in macroeconomic policy, to what extent people will accept that their money is being invested on behalf of them by the government. So these issues are related. So what I'll try to do today is go through some aspects of each of these three. I will look a little bit first at some macroeconomic policy issues and discuss a little bit of the macroeconomic policy challenges related to these uh, revenues. And then I'll look at some governance issues. And then I'll say a little bit about the investment strategy uh, for the Norwegian Fund as an example of how that has developed over time because investment strategy is not static, it develops over time. But I think that it's useful perhaps in your context, in the context that we are today, to spend perhaps a little bit more time thinking about the macroeconomic policy issues. So, if we think about this in a very conceptual way, um, the... Um, here. Um, if we think about this in a very conceptual, easy way, uh, this is a typical extraction path for petroleum. This is a non-renewable resource. So typically you start, you find something and you develop it, and then you, the, you have a tail production at the end of the production cycle. So this is typically what this looks like. This could be the timeline here isn't specified. For some countries, it's you know, 10, 15, 20 years. For other countries, it's 100 years or 150 years. Uh, but it's still the same basic principle. But we have, as consumers, a preference for smoothness. We don't want change. We want smooth consumption patterns. Um, so we don't want to spend money like this. We want something that looks more like this. So in this bottom diagram, the black line is supposed to say, well, what would be the development of consumption over time if you didn't have oil? And the red one is, what is the best consumption path after you found the oil? And it has the same shape. It's a gradual increase, but at a higher level. So we want to transform revenues that look like this into consumption that looks like this. That's the, and so the issue is what sort of policies uh, can help you do that and what is the role of a fund in that context. So when we think about these revenues from petroleum, uh, they are uh, different from other types of revenue that the government has. Typically, most government revenue in most countries is taxation, indirect or direct taxes. Oil revenues are a different type of revenues. Why are they different? Well, firstly, uh, they are coming from a depletion of wealth. You have to remember that oil in the ground is an asset, and money in a fund is an asset. So when you're selling oil, getting cash, putting cash in a fund, you are essentially transforming assets from one form to another form. That transformation process itself does not make you richer, but of course, your wealth becomes more visible. And 
these revenues are uh, uh, are uh, transitory in the sense that they come from the depletion of a non-renewable resource. They are tend to be much more volatile and uncertain than other, other revenues. We know that there have been historically large changes in the price of oil and gas. And so this has to be handled in some way, because we don't want that volatility to spill into volatility in consumption. And then we have a free money challenge. This is money that is sort of extra money because it comes from a natural resource. It's a gift from nature, over and above what we can create by working. So that has several uh, challenges. Uh, but there is another challenge with this, which is connected to it, and that is the macroeconomic impact of spending that, that money. So su suppose that the government spends 100 euros. That increases the demand in the economy by 100 euros. But they finance 100 euros by taxing 100 euros. That takes 100 euros out of the economy. And so the net effect, there is some net effect, there is, there, this is a bit more, this is a very simplified model, but this, the, the net effect is not that large on aggregate demand. On the one hand, you spend money. On the other hand, you're taking money out of the economy through taxation. What happens if you spend 100 euros of oil revenues? Well, you spend 100 euros, but there is nothing that takes money out <coughs> of the non-oil economy. So it has very different implications for demand growth in the economy, and this has to be recognized when you set it strategy. So these characteristics of revenues really uh, make it necessary to separate, firstly, spending from current petroleum revenues, because we don't want spending to change when oil prices change. We want the domestic economy to be more protected from these effects of the volatility in oil revenues. And we need to save a part of current revenues because we have, need to recognize that this is transitory. It will end someday. It's a non-renewable resource. So we need to make sure that we have consumption which is sustainable when that happens. And we need a suitable governance framework. So these are some of the issues that I'll try to address a little bit more in detail. Now, just looking at this, you would think that all countries in the world have this <coughs> consumption possibility, but those countries that have oil have a little bit of extra. So you would think that, on average at least, countries with oil would do better than countries without oil. Unfortunately, the opposite is true. So uh, let me skip to this one. This is a study that's done a few years back with the results are still true. Um, it turns out that unfortunately, on average, the countries with lots of natural resources do worse than countries without natural resources. So petroleum is not a blessing, it's a curse for these countries. So this is really important because we need to think very carefully about why is this the case? Why has this happened? And this is a large number of countries over a large period of time. So what are the mechanisms that makes this so challenging? And why is it the case, you know, the natural reaction to finding oil and gas is, you know, yes, uh, we will be rich and all our problems will be solved. I don't know if you recognize anything like that from your domestic debates. Um, but it's really important to think about the experience, that the experience of the average country with oil and gas revenues is the opposite. So we really need to think about what are the pitfalls that we need to avoid. Okay, so let me start with the uh, first one which is uh, relatively common. And that is lack of fiscal discipline. So once you get these revenues, there is a tendency to start spending them right away and very quickly. And that leads to something which is in so, uh, economic literature called Dutch disease, which the Dutch, is, they don't like that name, so I don't use that when I'm in, in the Netherlands talking about these issues. But uh, it comes from the 1960s, 
when uh, the Netherlands had huge gas revenues. They found gas, a huge gas field, and they used that revenue very, very quickly. And what happened? Well, there wasn't enough supply in the economy to meet that huge surge in demand. So inflation went up because there were more resources, more demand competing for the same supply. And so prices went up. And that meant that everything that was non-oil related became less competitive. So on the one hand, they made a lot of money from gas, but they made less and less and less money from other things because of inflation, high wage growth, meant that they lost competitiveness. And this is the Dutch disease problem. And it, it, it becomes a problem when the oil and gas revenues fall because then suddenly you have wiped out the other parts of your economy that you should be living out of at that stage. So this is the original uh, Dutch disease problem. And it's a really important uh, problem in practice because this has happened in a number of countries including Norway, I should say, in the 1970s and the 1980s. So Norway has not been a success story for all the time that we've had petroleum revenues. We had huge problems in economic policies in the 1970s, in the 1980s, uh, and then uh, we were lucky to have a third chance of doing it right in the 1990s, and it went better. Bad investments is a very typical uh, uh, so once you have a lot of money, uh, people start thinking about you know projects that have very limited economic value, but give you know the country or some politicians a lot of prestige. So let's buy a dozen 747s and start a national airline. Uh, you know, let's you know, all kinds of projects that have high symbolic value, but little economic value. And this drags down the return on this role. Lots of focus in structural policies, and I'll say a little bit about this uh, afterwards, but it has to do with the shift of focus. In many countries where you find oil and gas, suddenly everything is about oil and gas. But as I'll show you afterwards, the wealth of the country over time is primarily determined by what uh, the rector of the university quite correctly pointed out, the quality of human capital. That is what determines wealth over time. And there is a risk that you have lower labor supply, a lower productivity growth, and that the whole political debate discuss, it focuses more on how to get hold of the oil wealth rather than how to develop the non-oil sectors. And poor governance, which is also, uh, and unfortunately again, uh, when institutions already are weak, um, petroleum revenues has a tendency to raise the level of conflict. So it's really challenging because there's more to fight over. It's like a family would get an unexpected inheritance and then suddenly they start fighting. They didn't fight when they were poor, but when they get money, there's suddenly something to fight over. And the same happens with countries. So it's really important to understand these pitfalls and think about whether the institutional arrangements and whether the economic policy strategies are set up to deal with these pitfalls and avoid them. So, the value of human capital. This is uh, Norwegian numbers, uh, but, but they are, I think, fairly representative uh, of many other countries. Uh, and we have done, the Ministry of Finance did a calculation of what they call net value, uh, uh, national wealth which uh, for the, if there are economists among you, I'll just say this is defined as the net present value of all future consumption is by definition how you define wealth. And you can look at how much of this is uh, real capital, so the value of you know, buildings and factories and everything in the economy, 
Uh, what are the financial assets? This is a bit higher now for the Norwegian economy than it was in 2007, maybe 3 or 4 percent rather than 2. <laughs> um, this is the value of oil that is still in the ground. This is a bit lower now than 7 percent because we have extracted more. All of the rest here is the value of human capital. So that is the value created by the workforce, the net present value of all the revenue work. So, in this context, what happens if you use the oil money to fund a very generous early retirement scheme? You lower the pension age. Well, you don't have to lose many percent of this huge orange one through lower labor force participation rates before that completely wipes out the value of oil. So losing a little bit of your labor force is actually more harmful to you than losing the oil reserves. And this, I think, is something which is missing in many discussions, both on oil, but also, I think, if you look at the European discussions in many countries in Europe now about pension reform, this is the one thing that really can improve growth over time, is getting better incentives to work and increasing labor force participation. So, I think this is really important to give a content, context for the macroeconomic policy issues. <clears throat> so, let's go through some of the key principles of revenue management. And by revenue, I mean everything from oil is actually found and explored till the money is actually being managed in a fund or a central bank or wherever it's managed. So all the stages of that process. Well, firstly, you need an appropriate system for resource management. So you need a way, a good system of deciding where are you drilling, who is allowed to drill, how do you set up all the arrangements around, how you do you make sure that you have the best partners that you can have, and so on and so forth. You need an appropriate system for what we call government take. And by government take, I mean the government's total share of the total revenues. So uh, that can be through uh, taxation by taxing oil companies. It can be through uh, royalties. It can be through direct participation. It can be through a state-owned oil company. So there are various instruments that you can use to, for the government to get a large share of this natural resource well. And the thinking is that the at the outset, the natural resources belong to the people. And the role of the government is to make sure that the people get their share of this wealth. And you need a system designed to extract that. And that involves a lot of difficult issues because you're not only sharing revenues, but you're also sharing risk. So you have to decide what, how much risk do you want to take uh, do you want to participate as an investor? Or do you just want to take, uh, share profits if and when there are profits? And this is a difficult decision for many countries. And uh, again, unfortunately, in a sense, uh, the poorer the country is at the outset, the less risk they're able to take, and the lower is their <coughs> expected share of the petroleum revenue. So the poorer countries on average have to give more away to private investors to compensate them for the risk that they are taking, their offloading risk uh, from the government to the private investors. In Norway, we have a very high degree of risk sharing uh, with the government, but also then a very high expected return for the government. And you need a long-term fiscal policy strategy. And this is what I'll talk about in the fund construction. But this is, this is the strategy whereby you say, well, what is, what is an appropriate fiscal policy strategy given that I have these world revenues? A good budget process. Institutions of high quality and an informed public because if you want to have a long-term strategy for wealth management, that has to have legitimacy. People have to feel that because otherwise they will vote for politicians that you know, spend the money right away. 
So there's no way over time that you can insulate money in a fund or elsewhere unless that is in line with sort of the broad public consensus. And I think my, this is a personal view, but, uh, I think many commentators on this and academics on this perhaps overstate a little bit the value of, let's say, constitutional or legal restrictions uh, on the use of oil revenues because uh, those restrictions can always be overcome by creative politicians. So the important, for this to work over time, there has to be a broad public consensus that this is the right strategy. Otherwise, I think it, it, there's a huge risk that will fall apart. Transparency and accountability, I'll come back to that as well, but that is, of course, a prerequisite for accountability. So, when we talk about petroleum funds, it's not really a substitute for uh, fiscal policy. It's, it's not a fiscal policy strategy in itself. So you say, well, we want to have a petroleum fund. That's not a fiscal policy. That's not a policy strategy. It can be a tool to support a specific policy. So I'll say a little bit about that. Um, and uh, let me just point out um, here, some of these uh, links that uh, one should be aware of. Firstly, uh, petroleum activities have a direct dem demand impulse to the domestic economy. So this happens when exploration companies you know, buy goods and services directly from the local economy. There's an indirect effect because the petroleum sector generates revenues and taxes to the government, uh, and the government uses that uh, to buy goods and services from the mainland economy. Uh, and why this this link with a fund, I'll come back to in a second, but just let's pretend that for the time being that this just has a government. They go, money comes from the petroleum companies to government, and government spends that in the, in the domestic economy. So that creates demand as well. So this top here, top half here, uh, is really about fiscal <coughs> policy. It is about revenues and management of revenues and how much you spend on those revenues. The bottom here is our financial flows because the government, if they save money in a fund abroad, they will sell, um, their, they will buy foreign assets uh, and of course they will get export income from these assets so this is a way of recycling uh, the foreign currency that you get from selling petroleum. Uh, this works a bit differently in the context of a country which has a common currency with other countries than it does for Norway which has its own currency because we would be very concerned about the instability in our own currency from these volatile revenues. You wouldn't have that problem because you have a currency that you share with others, but um, this instability will then not come in the form of currency instability, but inflation instability instead. But these are more complicated, so I will not go into this, but just the main point here, I think, is that you need to try to map out what the ch various channels are that the petrol, through which the petroleum sector affects the economy. This is one way of mapping it out, but there really needs to be a map that shows you how those links are and how they operate. Um, there are different types of funds. Um, so a savings fund is a fund that has a primary objective of saving for future generations. Um, so this has typically you know, fixed inflows uh, and this is a rule of the type uh, every year we will spend, we will save X uh, billion euros or X percent of our oil revenues. Uh, so this is like a private person saying, I'm saving towards an apartment. Every month I will set aside 200 euros or whatever. Uh, and I will follow that rule even if I don't have the money. So that means that 
well, there is no real link between actual savings and what you put in the fund. Because the fund, if you don't have the money to put in the fund, you borrow, you have to borrow that money. So, th but this is a fairly common type of fund uh, for, uh, for petroleum producing countries. It's also a model which you see in countries with large government pension, uh, funded pension systems where the government actually puts money in a fund. Even if they're running deficits, they're putting money in a fund. But that means that there's no, the fund doesn't really reflect saving because if you're borrowing money to put in a fund, you're not really saving. Uh, stabilization fund is a more short term, so the focus is on stabilizing the economy in the short term. Um, and the financing fund model is really a fund model where you try to do both at the same time. So when people talk about the Norwegian model for petroleum funds, this is really what they're talking about. This was, I think Norway was the first fund to be set up of this type. This is now, I, I think it's, uh, this is, let, let me put it this way, this I think is the fund type that uh, the IMF, for instance, would generally recommend to countries to set up today. And it looks like this. So this is, really, this is the financing fund model, it's a Norwegian fund model, and it's really, really simple, but it has some important implications. So, try to go through this. The budget, the state budget, um, here, sorry, um, the budget receives all revenues that the government has, including oil revenues. But all the oil revenues are put in the fund. Now, the government obviously has a lot of expenditures, schools, hospitals, roads, uh, pensions. So when you take out all the petroleum revenues, you're left with what we call the non-oil revenues. And of course, these expenditures are much larger than the non-oil revenues. So you're left with a non-oil budget deficit. So that's the budget deficit you would have, excluding oil revenues. And then you take from the fund back to the budget exactly the amount you need to cover that non-oil budget deficit. So what's the implication of this? Well, there are a couple of implications. One is, what is the budget balance? Well, by definition, it's zero. When will you put money in the fund? Well, you will put money in the fund if and only if you have a budget surplus when you include the oil revenues. And it means that the fund over time represents accumulation of government budget surpluses. So it means that you will never put money in the fund if you have a deficit. And I think that makes sense. Because if you have a deficit and you put money, money in the fund, the only way to get that money to put in the fund is to borrow even more. So you're just leveraging up the government. You're borrowing money to invest. And if, that's, you know, if that is done in the private sector, we call it the hedge fund. So this, is, uh, so this has some costs. Now, the fiscal policy is then really the, the important aspect of fiscal policy is that how much of this fund, sorry, uh, how much of this fund should you take back to the state budget? Or in other words, how large should you allow the non-oil budget deficit to be? And this is where we have a fiscal policy guideline which says that well, the non-oil budget deficit should be equal to the expected real return on the fund, which is set at 4%. Think about what that means. You have a fund, you expect that the real return on the fund is 4% per year. And you take that real out, the real return out, you're left with a fund which in real terms is the same. You can think about this if you have a forest, the, fo the total volume of wood in the forest 
grows by 4% a year. How much can you take out, cut down from that forest every year? You can cut out 4%. And you can do that indefinitely. Because every year the forest grows by 4%, you take out those 4%, you're still left with 100% of the forest. And next year, the forest is 100 and grows to 104, take out the 4, and you're left with 100. What happens if you start taking out 5 or 6% of this forest? Well, you're eating into the forest, and gradually it becomes smaller and smaller, and eventually disappears. So the idea is that the fund is a permanent source of income for the government and that the fiscal policy rule ensures that fiscal policy is sustainable over the long term. And it is sustainable by definition because you only spend the real return of wealth that you have accumulated. So because the challenge for an oil producing country is really to think about sustainability of government finances over long periods of time. This is sort of a medium-term framework for thinking about that challenge and put, making sure that you're putting fiscal policy on a sustainable long-term footing. Uh, so I think, if, you know, this, to me, this fund mechanism is, in a sense, the Norwegian model. It doesn't mean that the 4% is appropriate for every country. It was appropriate for Norway in the context we had. But there may be other ways of investing that are in other, in, in not in financial capital, but in physical capital or human capital that are more appropriate for other countries. But this is a framework for thinking about this, and it ensures consistency in the approach to uh, petroleum revenues. One other important aspect, which leads me into the next question, because the, the you know the one of the most uh, frequent question is, well, do you have a fund, why can't we invest the fund in our own economy? Why? Because this fund is invested outside Norway. Everything is outside Norway. Why isn't the fund invested in Norway? Well, if you look at it from this perspective, the budget is where we decide what projects we want to finance in Norway. If we want to build a road, a hospital, a school, make other forms of investments in the domestic economy, that is done through the budget process. And if we decide to build a road, we vote on it in the budget, and on the margin at least, money comes from the fund. If we take decisions regarding the budget, which increases the nominal budget deficit, we go to the fund and take out the money. What would happen if this fund also started investing in the domestic economy? Well, it would become a budget number two it would become a second fiscal budget for all of those budget items that were not given priority in the ordinary budget. So this is a way of losing control over fiscal policy. Because through the budget process, hopefully you have a budget process where you think about what sort of demand impulses am I giving through the economy? How much inflation can I tolerate? How much supply can I generate? How much demand does the economy is the economy able to take? If you get a fund also investing in the domestic economy alongside the budget and in an uncoordinated way, there is no way that you can keep control over demand management. But there is another way of reasoning as well. So suppose that this is not true for all countries, but suppose that you are a country which has free access to international capital market, I think is a fairly good approximation for Norway at least. Well, what we do is, in Norway, when we evaluate public sector investments, we look at, we hope, uh, in theory at least, you want to take all available domestic real investments and sort them according to profitability. Then there is an, an expected rate of return on international investments, which is 4%, which is also the return hurdle for government investments. So if a project is out here, it gives more return than putting money in the fund. If you're out here, it gives less. So the optimal 
amount of investments in the economy is you know do all the do all the projects that has a positive return, which is a higher return than four percent. The amount of money that you have does not enter into this. There is no way here that you know this is not dependent on how much money you have at the outset. So, and this, if you think about that, it, it, that's a whole general principle. If you look at the profitability of an investment as a private investor, the profitability of that investment it does not depend on how much cash you have. It is defined entirely by characteristics of the project itself. So, you're on a slippery slope if you're trying to use the budget as a second, uh, sorry, the fund, a fund as a second budget. Because what you will do is you'll end up with these projects funded by the fund. And this is exactly why uh, countries with oil revenues tend to do uh, worse than countries without uh, oil revenues. Uh, so this is uh, a way of thinking about these issues. And these are difficult issues, right? It's not so intuitively obvious. And this is something that, you know, still lasts for 25 years in Norway. Uh, this comes up every year, so this is an ongoing discussion, and you need to be prepared for that uh, if and when you have uh, a fund in cycles. Okay, so uh, that was quite a bit of macroeconomic policy challenges, because I think those are uh, very relevant at the stage where you're thinking about you know, the impact of petroleum revenues for your economy. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit just on the governance structure and, and go very briefly uh, through some investment, that will be very, very briefly, uh, because I want to leave time for comments and questions afterwards. Um, but I think it's important, if you set up a fund, to have a very clear division of roles and responsibilities between different governing bodies. So here I've defined three governing bodies. One is uh, Parliament, Norwegian Parliament, and they are in the sense the ultimate owner on behalf of the Norwegian public. They have passed the law of the petroleum fund, which said, or the pension fund, which says that the Ministry of Finance is the formal owner of the fund. So in sort of a legal sense, the Ministry of Finance owns the fund. And the Ministry of Finance has put the money in an account with our central bank, and the central bank manages the money on behalf of the Ministry of Finance within guidelines that the Ministry of Finance has. So it's really important, and most countries with these types of sovereign wealth funds will have a structure that looks something like this. They will have some law, so they will have a parliament which has in some way or another uh, set sort of the outer parameters of, of this. Uh, it will very often be a ministry of finance that has some role in setting up the formal structure. And then either a central bank or a designated separate fund management uh, company that does the actual investments within the guidelines that the owner has set. But it's really, really important to think about uh, these relationships because there are some complex, what economists call principal agent problems in these relationships. This is what we call delegated asset management. You, you actually delegate the responsibility for taking risk to someone else, and you reward them for getting returns. So, uh, if you reward them for taking re getting returns, they will often have an incentive to take risks that you don't want. There are lots of difficult issues in uh, this relationship between these different governing bodies, um, and it has uh, also, of course, a lot of constitutional aspects as well. Um, that was mentioned previously that. You know, all countries are different, and they're different with respect to their history and their constitutional arrangements and their political traditions, and, and so on and so forth. And that will, may influence how this setup looks. But this is a really important discussion to have before a fund is set up. After you've set up the fund, there's no way that you're going to change. I mean, it's very, really, really hard to, to make changes. Right? So, really, an important discussion to have in advance. Um, just say a little bit about um, the Norwegian fund uh, very, very quickly. Uh, so, it, 
Now, the, the investment strategy is 60% equities and 35% fixed income, 5% real estate, or well, in the process of building up 5%. This has changed, um, I'll skip this in the interest of time. Um, this has changed over time, and we want to show this, that there's been sort of gradual changes in the strategy over time, and those changes have actually followed uh, Sort of pattern there is there has been a thinking behind these changes they're not completely random um, and that as the fund has become larger um, there has been removed from what we call nominal liquid investments those are type, those are you know, triple A government securities which are appropriate for someone who has a very short term investment horizon and moved to more real investments, like real estate, um, um, listed equities, which are more sort of protected against inflation, and more illiquid investments. So <coughs> investments that are sort of higher transactions costs where you need to hold them over a longer period of time. Uh, and so this really reflects that the fund has grown in size, and as the fund has grown in size, also the time horizon of the investments. When we started, when we made the first allocations to the fund back in 1996, uh, we did not think, uh, we, oh, we thought that there was a very real risk that the fund would be empty again after, you know, just a few years. It turned out to become a $600 billion fund uh, by the end of this decade, in my estimate is that it might be over $1 trillion. Uh, in the fund. Uh, so, uh, with, uh, given the investment strategy we have in fiscal policy rule, um, uh, we have a very long time horizon and that should affect thinking about the investment strategy. I'm saying this not because it's so relevant now, and more that if you start a fund and you want to think about the investment strategy, don't benchmark yourself against those funds which have been there for 10, 20, 30 years. Benchmark yourselves against funds that what these funds look like when they started, that's a more relevant benchmark. So that's really, uh, and, uh, so just, just a little input on all that. So, okay. So, um, one, uh, when you think about investment strategy, I think it's really important to try to define some investment beliefs. And by investment beliefs, I simply mean what do you, what do you think about the way markets operate? What is your view on what financial markets are? And it's really important to communicate that because that gives, it's a way of communicating, but it's also a way of disciplining management, making sure that you have an internally consistent uh, strategy. And think about what are your defining characteristics. The Norwegian fund, for instance, is a very large fund. Uh, it's a long term fund. It's state owned. How should that affect the investment strategy? And so, uh, the point here is really to maximize uh, expected return or purchasing power of the fund. But this, I chose this really for these last words here. Within the risk tolerance of ultimate owners. So this is a really important point. Uh, so I'm uh, an economist, so I can tell you hopefully sensible things about the relationship between risk and return in financial markets. So that is like telling you that there is a menu in financial markets. There are various combinations of risk and expected return out there that will be available to you as an investor. If you take this amount of risk, you can get this expected return. If you take that amount of risk, you can get a different expected return. But that's all I can tell you as an economist. I cannot tell you what the right level of risk is. Because some people are very risk averse. Uh, some people are risk lovers and, you know, jump in parachutes and you know, things like that, which a civil servant would never do. So, so the role of politicians is really to represent the electorate in think, making a decision about the appropriate risk level. And that's not something that you can outsource to some experts. Because the expert cannot tell you how much risk you should be comfortable with. The expert can tell you how much expected return you can uh, 
get from various levels of risk. So the expert can show you the menu, but you have to choose from the menu. So you need an institutional arrangement in place for your politicians to be able to make that choice on behalf of the people they represent. And I illustrate this point just by this graph. So it looks a bit complicated. Let me try to explain. And I'm nearly done now, so there will be time for questions. Um, so this is a thought experiment. The Norwegian fund was actually the first, I said that the first allocation to the fund was made in 1996. But we asked the question, Suppose we had started the fund on January 1st, 1900, 112 years ago. With the same investment strategy that we have today. And we calculated the returns we would have had on that strategy over time. And this shows the returns, but it doesn't show the return year by year. It shows, for each year, the average return over the last 15 years up to that year. So that's why this graph starts in 1914. Right? It starts at the end of 1914, which is the first year with a full 15-year history. Okay. So if we had started the fund January 1st, 1900, invested with the strategy we had, we, we have today, uh, we would have gotten a uh, real return over the first 15 years of around 4%, a little under 5 okay. However, you know, uh, in this period, why is this really so low here? Well, because it's, uh, these are real returns. And in the period just after World War I, there was hyperinflation, and that wiped out the value of a lot of the fixed income investments. So suddenly, if you looked at this around 1920, just after World War I uh, ended, uh, this looked pretty bad. If you were patient and waited a few years, it looked really, really good. The actual real return on this portfolio, on average, over all of these 112 years, is around 4%. So if you had set up this fund January 1st, 1900, and if you had predicted that this fund, on average, would yield a return of 4% 4, 4 real return over the long term, you would have been right in the sense that for the 112 years that have gone since, the actual real return has been around 4%. However, there would have been long periods of time where you would have significant deviations from that. And remember that this is not deviations in a single year. This is the average of 15 years. So here, and, and you know, the problem for the Ministry of Finance is that you will be criticized for being an idiot, uh, no matter which side you're on here. Right. So here people will say, well, you know, it's obvious that the actual return are much, the returns are much, much lower than 4%. So we're, why should we save when returns are negative? We should just spend everything right now. Okay. Up here people will say, well, the government is basing its budget policy on an expected return of 4%, but now we've had 12% return on average over 15 years. Surely that must mean that the government is wrong, that they're too conservative, we should be spending much more money. So the issue here is, if you choose an investment strategy which is vol with volatile returns, you have to be sure that you can live with that volatility that you have an institutional framework around your management which allows you to live for significant periods of time with returns that can deviate substantially from what you believe is the correct long-term average. So,
So that's what I said at the outset. I said, well, there is a link between investment strategy and governance, because governance structure must support the investment strategy, and it must reflect the characteristics of the investment strategy. And if you have a very a strategy where you take risk and have volatile returns, you need a much more robust governance structure. Okay. Reporting and transparency. Um, you can read what it says. Uh, my view on this is really that uh, transparency is not just key to building legitimacy for the fund, but also key for good governance of the fund. So this is uh, just by way of, of summing up. First, uh, repeat some of the lessons on policy framework. It's really important that you keep focus on the non-oil economy. So even when you, you know, it's, it's very easy to be led astray by focusing too much on oil. Uh, we have, you know, a lo lot of people coming here to listen to a lecture about oil management. Maybe if I come here to talk about pension reform, there wouldn't be uh, that many people, right? So it's very easy to be uh, very, you know, because this is really exciting, um, you know, really exciting stuff. And then, you know, uh, the, the technicalities of pension reform is sort of not so exciting, perhaps. Uh, but this is really an important lesson. Okay. Uh, thinking about what is a good fiscal policy framework. Thinking about do you have a budget process uh, or a, a framework that, that we integrate. So in your analysis of fiscal policy strategies that you're thinking about oil and gas revenues as an integrated part of that. Uh, you can have good use of a petroleum fund if it's designed well and it can support policies. And you need really to educate the public on these very, very, very difficult issues because otherwise uh, it's really hard to get it to work over the long term. And on fund management, I think, you know, just don't move too fast. Don't compare yourselves to funds that have been around for 20 or 30 years. It takes time to build up uh, skills. And also, I think, uh, to make sure that the risk in the investment strategies is understood well. A managed uh, The worst time to sell an asset is just after it's fallen in value. So if you have an investment strategy which makes that you, means that you're taking risk, make sure that you're not forced to sell just after you've lost money. So it means that your politicians really have to understand. We lost, in, uh, during the financial crisis 2008, um, the investment strategy we had gave us a loss of the total portfolio of around 23% uh, of the value of the fund in one year. And the fund at that point was around 100% of GDP. So the loss was uh, over $100 billion in one year um, and about a quarter of GDP. We were not forced to change strategy. On the contrary, we were able to stick to a strategy of increasing equity exposure. So through the financial crisis, we bought equities for over $150 billion. And when the markets came back in 2009, we were very well positioned. We made about 25% return on the fund in that year. Uh, if we had been forced to shut down risk taking uh, in 2008 or early 2009, uh, that would have been a disaster. We would have lost the money, but we wouldn't have been in there when the market's turning. Um, it's important to realize that it's really the strategy. You can delegate to a manager, but the returns that are added to active management, we didn't discuss that much, but the decisions that the manager makes within the mandate is not that important as, not as important as the strategy itself. And you cannot outsource the decision on how much risk Clarification responsibilities, you have to make sure that everyone understands who is accountable for what in this system of delegated uh, 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 asset management. And transparency, which I uh, mentioned. So, um, 
So I think the, this summarizes some experience that we had from Norway, but also I think draws some experiences from other countries. Um, hopefully you found some of this of interest and relevance. Uh, I'll leave it at that, uh, and I'll be happy to uh, answer uh, some questions uh, right after this, and I think George will, will help us moderate. So, uh, but I'll thank you uh, for your uh, attention so far. Thank you. So we have some time to take a few questions. Um, there must be a couple of microphones in the, in the room. Please use the microphone so we can do the translation. Um, please try to be brief and to the point so we can get to as many questions as possible. Okay, so is there, Luis? Uh, thank you. You had some very uh, wise comments to make about um, harvesting the forest. Um, but uh, at the moment, we are in the process of uh, finding if there is a forest and um, uh, how to build it up, uh, what kinds of contracts to establish various companies which are exploring, um, what the role of uh, uh, government, our government, would be uh, in, in this process. And I wondered if you have any comments at all on the early stages of uh, the process. Um, and how to build this up uh, to the point where you can begin to harvest it? Um, yes, I think um, you're right in saying that you are at an early stage. Um, I think there are two or three issues that I would uh, think about now. One is the resource management part of it, where I think there are, uh, again, uh, possible sort of benchmarks for the quality of those processes um, and thinking about what is a good system of government take. Uh, I think you're at the stage really where you are making some, even at this stage, you may be making some important decisions regarding the division of risk, risk taking between government and oil companies. And that has to do with the way you set up uh, the contracts for exploration. Uh, a low risk uh, for the government would be to say, well, you're free to explore. If you, if you make a profit, we'll take X percent of that profit. A higher risk for the government would be to say, well, you're free to explore, but we will participate with X percent, 30 or 50 percent in that license, which means we will pay our share of the investments and we will take our share of the profits. So in, in that model, where the government is participating as an investor, the government obviously is taking more risk, but the government can also expect higher returns over time. So a system where you only tax profits, but you don't give any deductions for losses, is a system which increases risks for the companies. And that means that the companies will only be interested in investing if they can get a higher expected return. One practical example, uh, which has to do with how tax systems are set up, is the issue of what's called a ring fence. And ring fence means whether you're taxed on a field by field basis or a company by company basis. If, you're taxed, if you tax each individual field, it means that if you drill a lot and you don't find oil, then that's the company's loss. And since there are no revenues, they won't get any deduction in their taxes. If you tax in each individual company, and that company is participating in several fields, and they make money in some of them, but they lose money on others, in their accounts, they will be able to draw and subtract the losses from the fields that were not productive right, against revenues from other fields. So that reduces the, the, the risk of the company. Right? So the government is sharing more of the risk, 
and that means that they can also ex take a higher return. So uh, this is a dilemma that very many countries face. Uh, some countries, uh, not in the sort of Cyprus category, but uh, uh, developing countries with very little uh, uh, sort of cap institutional capabilities, use the simplest form of taxation, which is just a royalty. And all the, the only thing you need for a royalty is just a meter. You just meter how much you produce, and then you pay a tax based on that. That is a very regressive tax, because it taxes the least profitable fields a lot in percent of their profits, right? Because it's a tax on the gross production value. So this transfers a lot of risk to the, to the companies. Uh, so uh, that's why I said, uh, you know, it's expensive to be poor because if you don't have the capacity to take risk you will get a low share of the value of the world resources and you have to give away a lot to the private investors so I think this is a type of essentially this is an investment decision it's a question of whether the government should be investing in this sector or just taxing returns if and when they come and that's an investment decision that the government has to make. And it has to do with your capacity and your willingness to take risk. Um, and it's an important decision because it can do influence how large share of the value of oil and gas that you can get over time. the same line. It's all about uh, state participation in that. It's, it's not a concessional model. We have the contractual model with production sharing contract, but it's more or less a discussion. It's about state participation. And of course, it's a, it will depend also at which stage it's the country, the level of state participation, because if you are at the early beginning, then the international oil companies do not like much the state participation, in a sense. But uh, I understand that it's quite it's more profitable the state participation. It's in Norway. At which level then you set up the state participation? I switch it off instead of that. Um, in Norway, the model has been that an assessment is made, of course, it's an uncertain assessment, but whenever a field is awarded, they make an assessment of expected profitability of that field. And the state, traditionally at least, the government participation has been adapted to expected profitability. So the government will take a larger share um, in a more profitable field. Um, I think the highest level of uh, participation in one field is around 70%. Uh, that's not typical. A typical would be between 20 and 50. Um, but there is government participation in most fields, at least the larger fields. And the smaller fields sometimes, um, it's not, you know, there are some investments for the companies that are sort of a fixed investment unrelated to size of the field. You know, a lot of the geologists and the interpretation of seismic data and so on and so forth. So if you get a very small, if you're an operator of a field and you get a very small share of a small field, is not very attractive to use your best resources on that. So for the smaller fields, typically the government has had a lower participation. But in addition to that, we have an oil company, Stato, which is partly privatized, uh, which also gets allocations. Um, the, uh, and then there is uh, taxation. 
So the relative value of this over time has varied a bit because there have been periods where there have been very heavy investments and when the net cash flow from the state participation has been relatively low. Now, over the last few years, we've had a more harvesting period with relatively high cash flows from the, from the state participation. Uh, so, just to make sure that I understood what you said, I mean, conceptually, if you create a fund, uh, it's better for that fund to allocate uh, money to sectors of the economy that are lagging or to new sectors in order to have sustainable, I mean, to create sustainability within the fund and furthermore to uh, give profit wealth to the people that supposedly they are the owners uh, of the resource, you have to put some funds either to the pension system or whatever. So ideally, from Norway's experience, what is um, the percentage that has to go to the, uh, to the people, I mean, except of investing to uh, industry? <coughs> Um, well, I think it's a bit difficult to answer that question. Um, you can look at it from various ways. If you look at it from the perspective of the value of oil in the ground, and start by looking at what share of that value will come to the people eventually through government participation. In Norway, that has been um, between, let me say, eight, 85 to 90 percent of the total value of the petroleum resources. In many developing countries, it's more like 30 to 40 percent. And that reflects the, the issue I raised earlier. With, it, it reflects high risk taking from the Norwegian government. But then when you think about how the money comes into the fund and how it's allocated, I think you're raising a difficult point which I didn't want to go into at all, which was the relationship to pensions. And I didn't even mention that we call the fund the pension fund, but it's not the pension fund. Is a petroleum fund, right? So the fund doesn't have explicit liabilities. Um, but there's an implicit liability, which is delivering a 4% rule return to the budget every year. Now, this is not four, exactly 4% 4 every year, and it's not based on what they actually make in each individual year. It's a long-term average is intended to be 4%. So when you set up a fund, it's very important to think about what are the explicit or implicit liabilities of that fund. And if you think about it in the context of pension funds, which you raised, those have very explicit liabilities. They have to invest in a way which makes sure that they can deliver the pensions that they have promised. Uh, the that's a very different type of investment strategy than you get from a fund of an oil fund type. We'll take one more question, and uh, I think we'll kind of move on to the reception on site right after that. Do we have one more? No? This 4% uh, that goes on average to the budget, is there any um, focus on development spending, development project spending for the country, or it goes to the general budget for the country? Um, it goes to the general budget. So there are no um, rules for what those money should, they're not earmarked for any specific purpose. Um, there is a discussion, of course, uh, in Norway, what should we be spending the oil money on? And, and you know, um, should we be spending more infrastructure or should we be spending more research and education? Um, I think my view on that is that in this setup, it doesn't really make sense to, to think about you know, what, what are you spending exactly those dollars on, right? Because everything goes into the same budget. So if you're saying that, for instance, if you're saying a development or infrastructure, 
or education. They think, well, um, education is so important, so we should be taking more money from the fund to boost education. My way of thinking, you should set up a strategy, ideally, and this is admittedly very ideally, when you set up a budget strategy, you should start with the things that are most important to you. So if education is more important, you should put money to education first. And then you should put other items in your budget in decreasing order of importance. So when you think about, should we be taking one extra dollar out of the fund, the question is not you know, matching that extra dollar to the areas in the budget with highest priority. It's about matching them to the item in the budget with the lowest priority. So the question is really, what is the marginal activity of government? If the government were to cut its budget by one dollar, where would it cut that dollar? And is that something that we would rather spend more on uh, over, the, over the fund? So I think that, that is the way that I would look at this issue of the, let's say, the marginal utility of one extra dollar from the fund to the budget. This is like having an exam all over again, so I feel like... Wow. <laughs> the exam is over. <laughs> Very nice. Um, let me just uh, say a couple of things just to close this. Um, Martin did an excellent job to highlight uh, the complexities of the issues involved. And uh, we were talking about issues on macroeconomic policy, uh, to issues on how to structure the fund so it's transparent and effective. And uh, then you have issues on what the investment strategy of the fund will be. And all these areas require expertise. Uh, each area has its own experts to, to really complete this, uh, this process. Martin is unique that has experience in all the areas. But uh, it's hard to find people that uh, do have that. So the lesson I think for us is uh, that uh, we shouldn't expect a successful um, design of a fund to happen behind the closed doors of some ministry. It will require a lot of debate and a lot of uh, experts to have a public and transparent debate. The public has to be part of the process in order to feel that they own the fund and they will be the best guarantors that the politicians in the future will abide by the rules they were set up. Um, so having said that, I would like to thank Martin, um, our audience, and of course the co-organizers, um, the Planning Bureau, the Royal Embassy of Norway, and the University of Cyprus. Um, you're all welcome to join us in the reception right outside the door.